So hello and welcome to today's lecture recap. And so I want to start by talking about what we did last time. And we were talking about the effects of heat being transferred into systems. We'd understood that that can produce a change in temperature. And we'd understood quantitatively how the heat is related to the change in temperature. And then we'd also understood at the end of last class how sometimes adding heat to a system can cause an even more dramatic effect, which is a change in the phase of a system. So for example, in this picture, you have a warm brick it's put in contact with some ice. And so at first heat is transferred from the brick to the ice and maybe heats the ice up. But then once the ice reaches zero, then the additional heat going in from the brick to the ice actually causes a change in the state of the ice into liquid. After I drew this, I realized that kind of looks like the brick has had an accident and is glowing with embarrassment, but in fact, it's just a change of phase due to heat transfer. So here's the basic formula for the heat versus the change in temperature. That would be in the simple situation where you don't have a phase change. And the new thing is that when you have a phase change, you have some heat that's transferred even though there is no change in temperature. Okay, so this formula doesn't apply in that situation because you have no change in temperature while the ice is melting into the water. It's just going from zero degrees Celsius ice to zero degrees Celsius water. <clears throat> if we want to take, if we want to calculate how much energy is that taking, then the quantity that we need is called latent heat. So we have a latent heat for melting or freezing. That's called the latent heat of fusion. We have a latent heat for boiling or condensing. Uh, that's called the latent heat of vaporization. And that's that number is how much energy does it take to melt one kilogram of ice, for example. And if you want to know how much heat does it take to melt some other quantity of ice, then you just obviously <clears throat> multiply the mass of your ice the mass of the, at least the part of the ice that melts, times the latent heat. Sometimes you'll be talking about going from a liquid to a solid, and then we would be taking heat out of the system, and so we would use a minus sign. So in various questions, you'll want to know what is the net heat added to some part of the system that is either freezing or melting, and so in the freezing case, you'll have a minus sign. In the melting case, you'll have a plus sign. I mentioned last time that what is what the heat is actually doing is, so this energy that you're adding, in this case, what it's doing is it's just breaking the, it's just kind of breaking the, the bonds that are holding all of those molecules into a solid. And so you need to add energy in order to do that. It's It's a higher potential energy configuration to have your molecules be able to move freely through the liquid. And so that's where that energy is going. Once you've melted all the ice, additional energy that you add goes into increasing the velocities of the molecules in the water. So we had a simple graph last time when you had some ice water and we added energy and the ice water was melting. This graph is just a more complicated version of that, where we imagine starting with ice or some other solid and adding heat all the way through both all, all the way through both phase transitions so that you end up with steam. And so I'll just go through that. So the x-axis here is how much heat we've added to the system. The y-axis is your temperature. And so in the first part of the graph, this shows that the solid is heating up. And the slope of that part of the graph reflects the specific heat for the solid. We saw in a previous lecture that if you have a higher specific heat, it's harder to heat up your material, and so you have a shallower slope. Once you get to this point, for water that would be zero degrees Celsius, then the additional heat that you add for a while simply goes into melting the ice. And so this 
flat part indicates that the temperature is not changing during that process. So we have to add a certain amount of heat, which is the mass of your ice times the latent heat of fusion until all of the ice is turned into liquid. And then if we add more heat, the liquid starts heating up. Now the slope of this part might be different than the slope of this part because the specific heat for the liquid is generally different than the specific heat for the solid of the same material. And so you would use this formula to figure out the relation between heat added and temperature change during this portion. <clears throat> At some point you get to the boiling point for water that would be 100 Celsius. And then again, the temperature remains at 100 Celsius as the water boils off. And you use this much heat in order to boil all of that water and turn the liquid into the steam phase. And now, finally, any additional heat goes into heating up those gas molecules, making them move faster. So I just have a question to help you consolidate that information. This question is asking about some ice, which is at an initial temperature T1, maybe that's minus 10 Celsius, something below zero. And we wanna know how much heat does it require to heat that up to some other temperature T2, which is above zero. So to, to heat it up, turn it into water and then have that water end up at temperature T2. Okay, so this kind of, this is going to be a part of many of the more complicated problems you'll see. You'll have some part of your system that has an initial temperature, an initial phase, and it'll have a final temperature and a final phase. And you'll want to know how much heat has been added to that part of the system during the process. So pause the video, think through this question, and answer which one of these answers gives the total amount of heat required to produce this transformation. Okay, so let's talk about the answer. And so the key thing here is that we start out with ice at temperature T1, which is going to be less than zero. And this process is really a three-stage process. So first we need to go from ice at temperature T1 less than zero to ice at temperature T equals zero. Then we go by adding more heat from ice at temperature zero to water at temperature zero. And then by adding even more heat, we go from the water at temperature zero to the water at temperature T2. Okay. And so we wanna know how much total heat has been added during this process. And so we just have to add up the amount of heat added in each part of the process. So in the first part, we have Q equals M times C ice times delta T. Because it's ice, we use the, the specific heat for ice. Delta T is the final temperature minus the initial temperature. And so that's zero minus T1. So it's M C ice times minus T1. In the next part, the ice is melting. So the temperature is not changing. It's staying at temperature zero. And so the amount of heat that we add, we use the latent heat of fusion formula. So we, we are adding heat. So it's going to be plus M times L. And that's how much energy it takes to go from that zero Celsius ice to the zero Celsius water. And finally, for this process three, we have that it's just water heating up. So now we use MC water, delta T. And now delta T is equal to the final minus the initial. And so that's going to be equal to T2 minus zero. And so the total Q is equal to the sum Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. And that corresponds to answer E 
for our clicker question. So in complicated questions that you'll see on the midterm or in the homework or in the tutorial this week, often you'll have various parts of your system, like the situation described here where you have a solid that might be at some hotter temperature, and then you put it in contact with ice water that would be at zero degrees. And there'll be some initial temperatures and there'll be some final temperatures and quantities of ice and water and so forth. And it might ask you how much ice is left or what is the final temperature or something like that. What is the equilibrium temperature? And the strategy for these kinds of problems is always the same. So what you're going to want to do is look at the various, make your before and after pictures, look at the various parts of the system and write a formula for the Q of each part going from the initial configuration to the final configuration. So in this picture, it might be, there's a Q for the solid, there would be a Q for the ice, and there'd be a Q for the water. And so we could calculate each of those. Sometimes it'll just be the heating. Sometimes it'll be a combination of heating and melting or heating, melting and heating, or various other options. Okay. Once we've written the expression for the Q for each part, then we want to relate the various Qs, and that's usually using energy conservation. So if in the bottom situation, or in a situation where we just have two parts, and there's no energy coming from the outside, then the sum of the two Qs would have to be equal to zero. Okay, so Q is the net heat added to each part. The sum of the Qs is the net heat added to the whole system. And if it's isolated, that will have to be zero. In other cases, the sum of the Qs might be equal to some heat that we've supplied from the outside. In the problem at the end of last class, we were supplying heat for some time T with some power P. And so we would calculate that the heat that's added to the entire system is equal to that power times that time. Okay. And once you have these various Qs and the various relations between the Qs, that's usually enough to solve your question. Okay. So it's very similar to the stress and strain problems where, again, you're writing an equation for each part and then you're understanding how the parts are related. So let's move on to one of my favorite clicker questions in the course. And this is a real world situation. So you're skiing, it's cold out and you go into the bathroom on the ski slope. Unfortunately, the bathroom is not heated. And so it's like zero degrees in there. And you notice that actually there's a choice of two toilets. So you have to sit down on one of these toilets. And the question is, which one are you going to pick? And the, the thing you notice is that the metal one, if you look up in the table, the specific heat is 200 joules per kilograms per Kelvin. Well, whereas the plastic one has a much higher specific heat, 1600 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Okay. And so, so think about this and you can think about like logically based on physics that you know so far, which one you, would you pick? Or based on your experience, which one would you pick? Okay. So I would pick based on my real world experience of cold metal objects. Uh, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't want to sit on the metal, the cold metal toilet seat. So I would probably pick B, the plastic seat. This is my personal preference. So there's not necessarily a right or a wrong answer here. Um, but you will find that if, if you touch the, the cold metal, even though it's the same temperature as the cold plastic, it will actually feel colder to you and it will be more unpleasant, at least initially, to sit down on the cold metal. So this is the thing we want to understand. The point of this question is just to get us thinking, why is that? Why, why does the, the metal feel colder? Because if you look at the specific heats, the metal actually has a smaller specific heat. And so if we think about, well, 
what's going to have, what's going to be overall easier to heat up to our body temperature? Is it going to be the metal or the plastic? It's going to require more energy to heat up the plastic to our body temperature. It's going to require less energy to heat up that metal seat. And so you might think it would be better for us to sit on the metal seat. But the thing we're missing here is how long does that take to heat the metal seat versus heating the plastic seat? Okay. And the key here is that the metal seat is much, much easier for heat to flow through. Okay. And so that's going to be important. So we want to talk now about this new concept of thermal conductivity, which is sort of how easy is it for heat to flow through a particular material. And so for the metal, what we can say is that the thermal conductivity is much higher than for the plastic. So if you sit down on the metal, what happens is some heat from your body starts going into the metal, but that heat has a very easy time spreading through the metal and it doesn't then stay localized near your flesh on the surface of the metal. So, so the heat from your body goes into the metal and then it goes further away out into the metal. And so the metal near your body doesn't sort of heat up quickly to 37 and stay there. It heats up a little, but then the heat goes away and now it's still cold. And so more heat from your body flows into the metal and then the heat keeps flowing away very quickly. And so heat ends up coming out of your body very quickly uh, in the case of the metal. In the case of the plastic, the thermal conductivity is very low. And so when you sit down, again, heat flows into the plastic, but that heats up the surface of the plastic and that heat has a hard time distributing itself through the plastic. And so the surface of the plastic then actually stays, it, it quickly comes to a temperature that's similar to your body temperature and it kind of stays that way. And so at that point, it's no longer taking as much heat from your body. So it, you sort of quickly heat up the very surface of the plastic, but that heat takes a long time to spread through the plastic. And so that's why overall, when you first sit down on a metal toilet seat, there's going to be sort of a much larger flow of heat from your body into the metal versus from the plastic, from the, your body into the plastic. And so, so the metal actually initially is cooling our skin at a much faster rate. And that's why we're, that's why we're feeling, um, that's why we're feeling that coldness right away, even though they're both at the same temperature of zero degrees. If we waited a long time, then overall, more energy would be required to heat up the plastic compared with the metal, but that turns out to be quite, quite a long time. And it's, and it's this rate, it's how much heat is flowing out of you per time that is going to be more important for how quickly are you feeling cold. Okay. So I want to do a, a quick demo. Actually, I have two demos. Oops. Sorry, uh, let me see if I can share that YouTube video with you. So I'm stop sharing my screen and share a video here. Autoplay. Okay, so, so in this demo, what I have is, is some cold metal. I found uh, a big aluminum pan in my kitchen. Here it is. And so this is like our metal toilet seat. And this water is like our, our flesh that's sitting down on the metal toilet seat. And, and so the aluminum has a very high conductivity. So the energy should be quickly flowing from the water into the metal. And so what we'll see is that even though this video is very short. So it's just, uh, probably going to be waiting, you know, 10 or 20 seconds. And what you see is it's already frozen. The water is now completely frozen to the aluminum pan. And so it didn't take, uh, I don't know what that was. The, the whole video is 47 seconds and half of it was just me trying to find the metal pan in the freezer. Okay. 
So that's a good demonstration of, you know, why, why uh, you, you don't want to sit on a cold metal toilet seat or, or like stick your tongue to a pole, that, that famous bad idea in the winter. Uh, you don't want to stick your tongue to a metal pole because it's going to freeze very, very quickly. The, the surface of, of your tongue will freeze because the heat is going quickly into the metal and spreading out through the metal. Okay, uh, let me share my slides again here. Okay, so, so that was that. Um, just to make sure everything is completely clear, let me give you another question. So I have one more demo for you and I want you to think about it first. Um, now we're gonna to kind of reverse the situation. And what I have over here is the same metal pan from the video. I flipped it upside down this time. And then I have uh, some sty styrofoam. So I'm gonna put the styrofoam beside. That's, that's going to be like our equivalent of the plastic. And what I'm gonna do, I've, I've got some ice in the cooler there. What I'm gonna do is put an ice cube on the metal and an ice cube on the styrofoam and We'll see which one we'll see which one melts faster, but I want you to predict it first. And so take a minute and, and you know write it down, commit to one of these answers, and try to understand why it would be, and, and then we'll do the demo. Okay, so so maybe first let's let's just understand. Um, so things are reversed, so it might not be immediately really clear what will happen. But let's just understand things in terms of this thermal conductivity. So I'm going to put a zero degree Celsius, uh, well, actually colder than zero. I'm going to put a, an ice cube, which is probably colder than zero. I'm going to put it on, on this room temperature um, metal and on the room temperature styrofoam. And so what will happen is that heat from the metal and from the styrofoam will start flowing into the ice cube. Okay. But what you can imagine is that when the heat flows from the metal, okay, thus cooling down the metal, that heat will quickly re be replaced by energy from other parts of the metal. And so the metal will remain near room temperature because it's being, it's being the, the, any heat that goes into the ice is quickly going to be replaced because the conductivity is very high. Whereas with the styrofoam, a little bit of heat will go into the ice from the styrofoam, but that'll cool the styrofoam at the surface down and it'll take a long time for that energy to be replaced from the rest of the styrofoam. And so what we would expect is that the ice cube on the metal should melt faster than the ice cube on the styrofoam. Okay, so let's let's do the demo. And so I have my camera here. And so we'll get an ice cube. Um, so let's start, oops, start one on the styrofoam. There it is. Um, and so I give the styrofoam a head start. Well, it's, it's like a race. Uh, it's like a race here. I even have some, some race music. So, so let's actually start the music and then uh, I'm gonna start the race. And so here we go. Here we go. So we'll put the ice on the metal now. melting race. Okay, so it looks like the metal, the ice on the metal is definitely in the lead. The ice on the styrofoam doesn't seem to be doing anything at all. There's not even a drop of water on the styrofoam. And here we are back to the ice on the metal, and it is melting very rapidly, so rapidly it's turning around, sliding around on the metal. Here's a different angle, different angle. Let's go back to the styrofoam, and it looks like there's an ice cube sitting there on the styrofoam. Nothing is really happening. It's just sitting there. No water coming out. Back to the back to the metal. Here we go. Push around. Lots of water coming out now. And it's just dancing around there on the metal. Is it gonna finish before the song finishes? I don't know. Ice on the styrofoam. Still doing nothing. exciting ice melting you've probably ever watched. Uh, get, it, get it finished before the song finishes.
All right, so almost. So let's look back at the styrofoam. There's not even a single drop of water. And so clearly the ice on the styrofoam has... Here's a bright idea. Wi-Fi that connects all over the place automatically. Okay. Autoplay was turned on. Um, so, so clearly the connectivity of the styrofoam is very, very much smaller than the connectivity of the of the metal. The ice is completely melted now. And <clears throat> so if you actually look up in a table what the thermal conductivity of, of, uh, of aluminum versus styrofoam, um, it is actually hundreds of times larger for aluminum. And so that's why we're, we're seeing such a dramatic effect. The entire ice cube melted on the aluminum before even one drop of water um, was, was showing up on the styrofoam. That back into the cooler, and and so um, so you know we maybe, maybe think of the ice as melting because of the air temperature, but you know clearly in this case it's the thermal conduction of heat from the surface into the ice that was having the big effect. Okay, well that was that live demo. Um, so so that is the idea of thermal conductivity that heat is able to flow more quickly through some materials than others. And what we want to do now is be a little bit more quantitative to define a specific measure of how quickly heat is flowing, and then to understand how that measure of the rate of heat flow is related to other properties, to the temperature differences between different parts of your material and the properties of the material. Okay. So, we're going to define this heat current and it's going to be, um, you know, with reference to a specific surface in our, in our experimental setup. So in this case, the relevant surface would be the interface between our, our flesh here and between the metal. And so what we have is a rate and the rate is the, amount of heat that flows <clears throat> across the interface divided by the amount of time. Okay, so it's units of joules per second. And so that would be the way that we quantify how quickly heat is going from one part of the system to another part of the system. Okay, you just divide the system, you choose some surface, and then you look at how many joules per second are going through that surface. And that is our definition of heat current. So it's very much like electrical current, which is charge per second going through a wire. Here we have, we have energy per second going through a surface. Okay, remember heat is just energy moving from one part of the system to the other part of the system. Okay, so before we get to an equation that predicts that heat current, I want you to think about this situation just to understand basic, a very important basic property of heat current. And so in this picture, we have what's known as a steady state situation. It's not an equilibrium situation in that the temperatures of different parts of the system are different, uh, but it's steady state because what we've done is heated up the left system to 100 degrees Celsius, and we've cooled down the right system to zero degrees Celsius. And then we have this bridge of material in between. And so we've just waited for a long time so that the temperature of all of the parts of the system is remaining constant. Okay, so we're having to supply heat here, take it away here, but then if you measure the temperature of any part, it just stays the same. It's zero here, 100 here, something in between if you look at points on this material in between. And so this question is asking for you to rank these various heat currents. So if I look at the heat current through this system, th this surface, through this surface, or through this surface, how are those going to be related to one another? So pause the video and think about it. If you've thought about your answer for the, for the original question, think about a more complicated situation where this is not one material, but a combination of material, like metal here and styrofoam on this half. Would your answer change or would it be the same? Okay. So hopefully you've had a chance to think about that. Let's talk about it. So 
But there's basically one thing to understand here, and that is that because energy is conserved, any energy that flows from this part of the system into this part of the system must also flow from this part of the system into this part of the system. Since we're assuming that energy is not building up here, we're assuming that the temperatures of the various parts are no longer changing, and so we can no longer have any net flow of energy into any part of the system. Okay, so that means any energy flowing into this part must also flow out of it. And so if we think about the heat current, the energy per time going from the 100 Celsius side into this middle object, that heat current must be the same as this heat current, and it must be the same as this heat current. So if it's 100 joules per second going in, it has to be 100 joules per second crossing the middle, and 100 joules per second crossing this barrier here, and so all of those heat currents have to be equal to each other. So the answer is B. It's very much like the electrical current in a circuit. In a circuit, even if you have different resistances, if you connect all of them up to a battery and you have a current flowing, the current is the same in all parts of your, in all parts of your circuit, if it's just a single loop. And it's because any charge that flows into one part has to flow out of it. We don't have charge building up in the circuit as long as that's in a steady state. What about the extra part? What if we put metal here and styrofoam here, and then we let that settle down and we measure the heat currents after a long time? So the answer is the same. As before, our assumption that the system has settled down, set, settled down to a steady state means that any heat that flows into the metal has to also flow out of the metal into the styrofoam. And if you have 100 joules per second flowing into the metal, then 100 joules per second have to flow into the styrofoam. And 100 joules per second have to flow out of the styrofoam into this zero degree, uh, in, into this zero degree region. Okay. So that's a, maybe a little bit um, counterintuitive, but we'll understand this better later in the lecture and especially in next lecture. For now, I'll just mention that it's kind of like if you have different resistances in a circuit and the larger resistance and the smaller resistance, they have the same current through them, even though you might think, well, it's harder for current to flow through the larger resistance than the smaller resistance. But because they're all in a circuit, it has to end up having the same amount of current. And in this situation, it's again, if as long as we're assuming that everything is settled down to a steady state, has to end up that you have a, the same amount of heat current going through these various parts. All right, so how do we predict the amount of heat current that's going to flow from one side to the other in a situation where we have these different temperatures? So we have a basic relationship that says the heat current is going to be proportional to what we're going to call the temperature gradient. Okay. So it's important that there's two different temperatures on either side of our object in order for there to be heat transferred at all. And so it's the difference that is important for determining this heat transfer. But it's not just the temperature difference. If we have an object that's very thin and the same temperature difference, we're going to get a larger heat current. And so the important quantity is actually the temperature gradient. It's like the difference in temperatures divided by the length of your object. In terms of calculus, that's like the spatial derivative dt by dx. That's what determines how much heat is going to be flowing. Okay, so if I, if I want to understand the heat current through this surface here, the important thing is how quickly is how how big is this gradient of temperatures in this part of the material? Okay. What else does the heat current depend on? So the heat current is proportional to that temperature gradient. It's also proportional to the cross-sectional area of this material that we have. So if we had 
two of those connectors, then clearly we would be able to have twice as much heat current flowing through if the, if the temperatures and the lengths are the same. So that's why the heat current is also proportional to the area as well as the temperature gradient. And then finally, we have a proportionality constant. And this is another one of these basic properties of materials that you can measure and look up on in tables if you want to understand what, what it is. So for aluminum, your K is a, is a large number. For styrofoam, it's a much, much smaller number. So that's the thing that we call the thermal conductivity. And, and in your textbook, there's just a table of these values in chapter 17. Okay. So to finish today, I basically want you to spend a few minutes processing this formula. And so to help you do that, we have a question here that asks you to rank from smallest to largest the heat current that would flow from left to right in these various situations. So take a minute to think about that, pause the video, choose one of these answers, and then we're going to end today by going through the logic for which one is the right ordering. Okay, so let's have a look here. It's easiest if we just compare these things two at a time. So number two is clearly going to have a greater heat current than number one because it's just the same object and then we have two of those instead of one. So in this equation, the area in the second object, the, the cross-sectional area in that second situation, is going to be twice as much and the K and the temperature gradient are going to be the same. Okay, so we have two greater than two is greater than one. Let's compare number one and number four. So in number four, the only difference is that the length is greater than in number one. And so in number four, we're gonna have a smaller heat current than number one. So we have two is greater than one is greater than four. Okay, and so that gets us down to, well, answer B, C, or E. What about number three? Let's compare number three and number one. So steel has a smaller thermal conductivity as compared with aluminum. And so because the steel's K value is one quarter of the aluminum's K value, then three is going to be smaller by a factor of four than one. <clears throat> So the only thing now is what about three versus four? So we said three was a factor of four smaller than number one, whereas no, number four is only smaller by a factor of two. Okay, so the smallest one here is number three, and then the next smallest one is four, and then one, and then two. And so the answer is going to be two is greater than one is greater than four, is greater than three, three being the smallest of them all. Okay, so that's all for today. And we will talk more next class about thermal conductivity problems. And we're gonna go back and understand that slightly confusing example with the metal and the styrofoam between the two sides.